Hi everyone and welcome to the last video lecture of the semester. So we're diving into the 20th century. We left off last week kind of with the with the end of the Civil War. Um, and moving into the 20th century, it's impossible to overstate the impact of the Civil War on U.S. culture, politics, and economics. Uh, it is by far the bloodiest conflict this nation has ever seen. I think estimates have uh, a total of 1.2 to 1.3 million pe people dying in, in conflicts over all of American history, so moving, looking at the Revolutionary War up to the Vietnam War and ongoing wars today. Uh, and then half of that number, so 620,000 or so, died during the Civil War. So people were dying on a scale that is hard for us to even imagine today. Um, and then the people who lived through the war, uh, a lot of them knew people who died, um, and it, it brought about this kind of disillusionment with American ideals. So. Um, if you if you recall our literature from the 18th century where we have Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, uh, taking this very idealistic stance of what the nation could be, uh, the writers who were writing after the Civil War tended to, ha to, to be much more skeptical and much more pessimistic about the, the promises of the nation. Um, so the aftershocks of the war show up in American literature and the arts at the beginning of the 20th century especially. So writers were still responding to the altered circumstances, landscapes, and just general mood of the country during these decades. In addition with, with grappling with the particular dislocations of the Civil War, the early decades of the 20th century saw profound advancements in science and technology, and it's to those advancements that I'll turn now. Most of our literature that we're reading this week comes from the first 50 years of the 20th century. Um, and so let's just take a look at what happened in those 50 years. First, we have World War I and World War II, uh, major conflicts that I'll return to later. Thinking about what day-to-day -day life looked like for, for most people, between 1899 and 1950, we see the invention of the automobile. So we have cars, trucks for the first time on the road. We see the invention of the airplane the vacuum cleaner, the chainsaw, air conditioner, so all of these modern conveniences that suddenly make it so much easier to clean your house, uh, to chop down a tree, and to, to keep cool in the, in the hot summer. Um, we also see the invention of plastic, and this, uh, the significance of this is hard to overstate. I would ask you to take a look around you and just note how many things are made of plastic. Around me, I see a cup, a pen, a pair of glasses, all made from plastic, an air conditioner made of plastic. Before the 20th century, it did not exist, so everything had to be made from natural fibers. Um, this 50-year period also saw the invention of the washing machine, the television, the refrigerator, ballpoint pen, nylon, high-speed photography, contraception, barcodes, and then so much more. Really, in this 50-year period between really 1900 and 1950, the world becomes a modern place. Here's a visualization of what these drastic changes look like. So this photo here on the left, the black and white picture, is Times Square in 1899. The photo on the right is Times Square in 1950 you can see massive differences in the appearance of this same space. In the first photo, we see, we see horses on the road, there's a tram, but primarily it's people walking. The photo on the right, uh, we see buses, cars, a little bit more traffic there. Two of the notable differences, in addition to the transportation, are the lights and the advertising. So in the first image, uh, we would have had gas lights, maybe some electric street lights at the very beginning, but in the 1950s, the whole space is lit up. We have advertisements all along the buildings, of making this making this a city that never sleeps. Uh, additionally, we see recognizable brands. There's Chevrolet and Pepsi, brands that still live with us today. In this 50-year period, we see the rise of mass culture and recognizable brands that would have been just as present in New York as they were in Boston, as they were in Kansas and California. But in the 1890s, this wasn't really the case. What did these changes mean for American literature? Primarily in the period that we're reading from today, we see a, a move from American realism, which is the aesthetic movement at the very beginning of the 20th century, to modernism, which is the aesthetic movement that, that characterizes the middle decades of the, of the 20th century. So let's, we'll just move through these chronologically. 
So some of the writers that we're reading today, uh, we would understand as realist writers. And American realism was an aesthetic movement that emerged in the United States after the Civil War, and it's something that would have been present in literature, music, theater, and the visual arts. Realist, realist writers would have been heavily influenced by the rise of Darwinism in the late 19th century, and they were also influenced by this idea of whether or not there, were, there was free will. So two of our writers, uh, Sui Sun Far and Charlotte Perkins Gilman, are considered realist writers. Characteristics of realism include a deterministic philosophy that challenges the idea of individual free will. So you can imagine this as a, as a consequence of the American Civil War, where so many people died, and it kind of brought about this existential crisis. There was also a belief that forces of environment and hereditary shape and heredity shape human lives, a quasi-scientific perspective on characters who are often defined by their race and class-based traits rather than by their individual natures. And this is what Farr, in its wavering image, was writing against in her story. So she was pushing back against this idea. Um, also, realist writers have an interest in what reviewers of the day say as low, say were low and sordid subjects. So uh, we have writers writing about sex and violence and working class lives. Um, and we see a little bit of this in Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, where she's writing about mental illness, and she's writing about how that particularly plays out for women. It would have been a topic that wasn't polite, you know, kind of dinner table topics. Um, and that's, that's something that realist writers didn't back away from. Here are two paintings that are considered part of American realism. The first is a fruit stand at Coney Island by a, a painter named Clackens, and the second is McSorley's Bar by John Sloan. Both of these paintings don't really attend to the, the worlds of wealthy and uh, idealistic spaces, but rather we have a fruit stand and a bar, these places um, of, of everyday lives. So this is, this is what uh, American realism looked like. Similarly, we have the, the uh, rise of photography at the beginning of the 20th century, and these two photographs are also considered a part of American realism. Um, the first is Winter, Fifth Avenue by Alfred Stieglitz, who um, just so happens to be the husband of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, and then on the, on the right, we have The Bandit Roof uh, by Reese. Uh, again, both of these are, they're not idealized image, in, images at all, kind of rough around the edges, but true to what life was like for many people in the beginning of the 20th century. As you're reading It's Wavering Image and The Yellow Wallpaper, I want you to think about these two stories as part of this broader aesthetic movement, American realism. So each of these writers, Sui Sen Far and Charlotte Perkins Gilman, along with many others, were engaging with the, the real existential questions and crises that emerged after the Civil War. They're a little bit more skeptical of ideals, and they represent life in, in, a, in a very different mood with a very different perspective than we have in the past. Um, but at the same time, I want you to think about what makes these two writers and these two stories stand out. But now let's move on to modernism. After World War I and World War II, Things in the literary and artistic realms change drastically. This is where we see a move from realism, which I've just discussed, to modernism. In a lot of ways, we can think about modernism as a reaction against a lot of the aesthetic ideals that had come before. Where realism tried to represent the world as it was, so you can imagine the photograph of the alley, the, pic the painting of people buying fruit, as a fruit at a fruit stand, these attempts at true representation, um, modernism dismissed that completely. Instead of trying to represent the world as it was, they tried to experiment and make things not necessarily look very realistic, but rather very abstract. Modernist art and literature attempts to represent the experience of a world in crisis. During this period, we see urbanization, the rise of monopoly and state capitalism, political movements, imperialism, mass culture, and just all of these things um, and how they influenced individual people. Most of these artists and authors would suggest that, that all of these forces gave gave way to an overwhelming sense of self-fragmentation and a loss of individual agency. While realism sought to represent the truth, modernism rejects the very notion of truth. 
this is a representation of modernism in the visual arts. So this is Pablo Picasso's Guernica, which was painted in 1937. And in short, it's an abstract representation of bombing of the bombing of a village in Spain by Nazis in 1937. So in this painting, we there's a lot going on. It's very abstract and it's not a realistic representation at all. There's no bomb, there are no people bleeding, but rather we have these bodies contorted, heads bent every which way. Um, in, in an abstract representation of pain and suffering and violence. By leaving behind realistic representations, modernist art could, could present uh, feelings, could present events in new ways. In this representation in Guernica, we see the bodies of, for example, humans and animals being blended together. And you can think about that as a consequence of the bombing, where people aren't treated like humans at all, but rather are just violently, um, or, but their bodies are just violently acted upon. But not all modernist art was, was quite so brutal. Sometimes it could be playful as well. So this is something that you may have seen in the past. It's called uh, The Fountain. It's by Marcel Duchamp. You will recognize this to be a urinal. The actual piece, The Fountain, was not a photo of a urinal. It wasn't a painting of a urinal. It was an actual urinal that was placed in a, a very prestigious museum. Um, and it was sat, sat there to get people to question the very nature of art. So I mentioned before that modernists questioned the idea of truth at all. They also questioned what makes something art. At the same time that we have a lot of the um, the the heaviness of, of artists and authors dealing with uh, things like war, we also have a kind of playfulness that comes with modernism as well. Our modernist writers include Robert Frost, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and Langston Hughes. And while each of these three writers is writing recognizable poetry, it's not so abstract that we can't recognize it, um, they are um, kind of bucket playing with tradition a little bit. So as you're reading Malay's poem, I want you to think about how she uses abstraction to, to convey deeper emotions. Uh, similarly, I want you to think about how both Robert Frost and Langston Hughes seem to be pushing against tradition a little bit. So what's shocking and what's surprising or what's maybe even subtly different about their poetry uh, compared to someone like Walt Whitman or Emily Dickinson? So where do we see them experimenting? What ideas do we see them, you know, kind of taking and then just dismissing? If we think about modernism as a reaction against what came before, how are Hughes, Frost, and Millay uh, reacting against things that we've read in the past? Finally, we're left with our postmodernist writers. Uh, so postmodernism, again, is an aesthetic movement that includes literature, visual arts, music, and many other media. In general, as an aesthetic movement, it shares many of the same features as, of modernism as authors and artists react to new technologies and global conflicts. So just like modernism, postmodernism has a lot of abstraction, there's a lot of play, and there's kind of a rejection of realistic representation. While modernist authors wanted to break with artistic tradition completely, many postmodern artists mix new and old styles. So that's one distinction between modernism and postmodernism. Finally, postmodern literature reflects a breakdown of high and low culture. We see postmodern literature, short stories, poetry, drawing imagery from consumer culture and mass media. And that's something that the modernists didn't really do too often. So our two, our two modernist authors uh, for, for this semester are Gloria Ansel Dua and Tim O'Brien. And so before, before we look at them specifically, I'll show you a visual representation of the, of the difference between modernism and postmodernism. So just to return to Picasso's Guernica, here we have this abstract representation of violence. Um, it's a modernist painting. And then someone like Jackson Pollock would be a postmodernist. It's even more abstract, it's even more difficult to discern what this representation is than Guernica. So um, this had been a big jump from a uh, realistic representation before, and this is even more abstract. So similarly, postmodernist literature often experiments even more than what we get uh, from modernism.
And so as you're reading Gloria Anzaldúa in particular, I want you to think about how she's experimenting with the very form of her poetry. Spatially, it looks different on the page. There's often moments where she doesn't translate the Spanish, um, which is a, a kind of a postmodernist technique. Similarly, when you're reading Tim O'Brien, I want you to think about how his frequent catalogs of you know kind of mass culture items is really different that from the catalogs that we might get from someone like Walt. Whitman writing poetry in the 19th century. So we have a difference in genre, but there's also a really distinct difference in the kind of images that we see in O'Brien's short story. That's it for me for this week. Next week we'll be looking at literature produced in the last three years, so I'm sure you'll breeze through the 20th century and I'm really looking forward to reading your proposals and seeing what we add to the syllabus based on your suggestions. So happy reading! Please let me know if you have any questions about this, the quizzes, or anything else in the class. Alright, see ya!